All you have to know is that Jesus is a healer. All you have to know is that he's compassionate. Bless God, he comes by and he picks you up out of the dirt, out of the pain of your life, and he lifts you up on solid ground. He said, look, I love you. I care about you. I'm the healer. I'm your blesser. I'm your savior. I am the one you've been looking for. Trinity Gospel Temple presents Brother Dave and the Hour of Power Singers. Hello, everybody. The Lord bless you real good. So good to have you on board today. I appreciate you being a part of our extended family. I've learned to love you very much and reaching out to you with my whole heart and trust in the Lord that your faith will elevate today as we minister the word. And then we'll be praying together at the close of the program. Stay tuned. You're my first love. You're my last. You're my future. You've forgiven all my past. And everything good comes from you. And when I see the way you love me, all that I can do is cry. Holy been my closest friend and every time I call on you you lift me up into your presence all that I can do is cry holy is the Lord almighty worthy is the man that was slain holy is the Lord I will live for all my days I will give you all of the praise is he in all of his ways. Amen.
So what could I say? cameras we're going to be praying for people right now that need special help today we love to pray for people because god answers prayer did you know that something happens when we pray that would not have happened had we not prayed <laughs> so let's pray father in the name of jesus christ of nazareth 
We pray today, Lord, for people who are watching, listening, wherever they may be. We ask you, Lord, to send out your Holy Spirit to draw them to Christ. If there are those that are unsaved, I pray that today they will feel the call to come to Christ before it's eternally too late. Save the lost. Oh, God, call those who are backslidden and away from you back to the throne in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we pray for people everywhere, wherever they may be, especially those who are sick today. We reach out to those in hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living, at home, wherever they may be. We pray that you will touch them, lift them up. I ask you to lift them up. I speak peace into their heart, hope in the midst of despair, and healing virtue from Jesus flowing into their veins today. Lord, we pray for all of our friends, our bikers, our truckers, those, Lord, on the reservation, and all those across the country, Lord, who take time to tune us in, how we pray for them, Lord, wherever they may be. Lord, we're just so pleased that we can reach in the far-flung nations of the world and throughout all of the states of these United States and touch people for Jesus. We pray this day that they'll be drawn close to you. Lord, we pray for our military. We pray for our government. We pray for our president. We pray, Lord, for those that watch over us here locally, whether it's in the state highway department or the sheriff department, city police, city fire departments, or, Lord, the first responders. We bless them. Bless our city. Bless our schools. We pray in Jesus' name. Let there be peace. Let there be real, genuine learning in our schools. We pray for safety for our students, for our teachers for those that watch over them. And we ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And everybody said amen. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our morning. The love that cast out fear You are working while we're waiting You're sanctifying us
the audacious mandate of the believer. And uh, we have the right to be bold in how we believe and what we believe. And because we've been given a commission, a lot of times churches call it the Great Commission. I call it a mandate. And it is something that God has ordained for us to carry out. So in my introduction today, let me start here. Today we're going to exoterically investigate the kingdom of God. Now when I say it that way, I mean that it's open. It's not clandestine, it's not closed. For instance, I don't know, you watch a lot of television, a lot of news constantly, all kind of investigations going on, all that, and you'll see them sometime, they'll use documents. And they'll use a document and they'll say, well, a part of this document has been redacted, been crossed out. So half the time the document hardly make any sense because you got half of it redacted out. I want to tell you something about the Bible. It's not redacted. It's open, the whole gospel. Let's say the whole gospel. And that's what we want to investigate. And since we are intrinsically counted as individual members of his kingdom here on earth, we must become acquainted with the plethora of truth, including three major things. First, its inception, the inception of his kingdom. Secondly, the agenda. Yes, the kingdom has an agenda. And thirdly, its bill of rights. The master is elevating us to an infrangible, irreducible life commitment that is exponentially higher of the highest magnitude of anything in the whole world. No matter what you aspire to, no matter how much learning you have, if you don't have this, you don't have the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And you know in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we're looking at the kingdom of God today. The kingdom of God is both an authority, and we'll call that a reign. That continues, and we'll explain. And then it also means a place or a realm. Now, I don't know if you watched uh, the funeral of uh, uh, Ms. McCain, this, uh, Senator McCain this week, but I'll just mention one speaker, and that was uh, Lieberman. Lieberman, one very close friend of John Glenn. As you know, Mr. Lieberman is a very devout Jew, Senator Lieberman, and he practices Jew, Jew, uh, Judaism. And uh, they were talk he was talking about the fact that he and uh, John McCain talked often about Jerusalem because he, he, McCain was fascinated with Jerusalem. And, of course, Lieberman, a Jew, was a practicing Jew and certainly was fascinating. So John McCain used to tell him, said, I hope that one of these days you'll buy a home in Jerusalem with a back porch so that we can look out over that beautiful terrain. But he said something interesting, Lieberman, did he talked about the physical Jerusalem and then he alluded to, he said, he said, but we know that that's the physical, but there's something spiritual in heaven. We're all looking forward to go to heaven. And we know that the new Jerusalem is in heaven. Praise be to God. So I was just touched by that. It was just a little passing remark, but it blessed me as it went by. So when we talk about this kingdom, we know that it's a kingly rule of God over all persons, places, and things. Now back to this authority and then the realm. We have the reign of Christ which continues all throughout our grace dispensation. And we'll talk about what will happen then after this grace dispensation where we go through a seven-year period of the tribulation where the world goes through it, the church is taken out. You say, well, what are we doing in heaven while they're going through the seven-year tribulation? I didn't intend to get into this, but this comes naturally, it seems. Well, I can tell you this. When do you think they're going to give out the rewards in heaven? The only time that's left for it to happen would be during that seven-year period. Well, all hell is breaking loose on earth. God's up there honoring us for our faithfulness, and the crowns are being given out, and the heavenly Father is presenting his own son. You talk about, you talk about a game. You talk about a, a get-together. Praise God, I can't hardly wait until we get there. But, but I wanted to say is that there is a realm 
of the kingdom that's going to come on earth. And Jesus himself is going to be the king. And he's going to rule and reign on this physical earth for 1,000 years. You and I, as born-again believers, after we've been resurrected and go to heaven, receive our rewards and have all the joyous time, maybe get acquainted a little bit with our mansion or whatever, that new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven. It's going to set down on earth approximately where the Israel is now. And it'll be right side by side, it looks like to me. And the saints of God in their glorified bodies are going to serve the Lord and they're going to live in the new Jerusalem. There'll be no night there. There'll be no need of a light or the sun there because Jesus is the light. I don't know if you're getting this today, but it's just getting ahead, of the, getting ahead just a little bit. But it's going to be a thousand-year reign where Jesus will rule and reign and we will live without fear and without sin, sickness, disease, or death. Can't you say amen for that in Jesus' name? <clears throat> So the doctrine of the kingdom begins in the Old Testament. This is not something new, it's just in the new. The prophets of old spoke about the kingdom. Let's go to Psalms, 103rd Psalm, the 19th verse. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and, read with me, his kingdom rules over all. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel's a wonderful prophet in the Old Testament, told things that were going to happen years and years and thousands of years later. Prophesied them, let's go to the second chapter, verse 44. And in the, in, <clears throat> in the days of these kings, <clears throat> the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Did you notice the word kingdom? Everybody say kingdom. <clears throat> Which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Let's go to the seventh chapter, verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High God. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. That goes for every. And that's why people, when they feel that we're a little bit insulting when we talk about the Muslims or Buddhists or somebody else and saying they're, having, they're going to kneel their knee. <clears throat> you know, we're doing it voluntarily, but there will be a day when every person, doesn't matter what denomination, doesn't matter what religion they represent, every knee shall bow. And every tongue, I don't care what it is, communist tongue, socialist tongue, every tongue, white, black, brown, yellow, red, every tongue is going to confess that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Give him some praise. <clears throat> the kingdom announced in the New Testament. In John, you remember, we mentioned it's shown here in the Old Testament. Now, here we go into the New. John the Baptist was the first herald of the kingdom in the New Testament. Let's look at it in, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 10. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it shocked everybody because they, it was a voice as one crying in the wilderness. He was not a normal person uh, like you would say. He wasn't a... He wasn't a Fifth Avenue man. He came in. He, he, he looked like the hippies of the 70s. And they said, a long beard and, and all kinds of things like that. And, of course, I just remind a few people what they looked like a few years ago. <laughs> I, it was quite a time. I wish I could talk about it right now. But Jesus, like John the Baptist, began his earthly ministry by preaching the kingdom of God. Now, notice my whole message around this kingdom business. So while John did not know when the visitation of God was going to come, he just repented. He says, that hand, some point in time. But when Jesus came on the scene, he said, the time is fulfilled. It's already started. Look, okay, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after John, after John, 
was put in prison. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom of God. Okay, let's verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled. So that proves that the kingdom of God started right then. Jesus, who is the king of the kingdom, brought the kingdom right to earth right there. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. What shall we do because of it? Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verse 43. And he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because of this purpose I have been sent. And then one other verse. Let's go to the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse this time. Oh, I, okay, and that was all right. But, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in the synagogue. Can you imagine the nerve? At least people thought, what nerve does this young guy have here? Teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and doing what? Yeah. Now watch, because if you'll, if you'll watch, we're going we're gonna to head into this. We're going to show you that the proof of the kingdom of God is and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Notice that when he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom and, part of it, and healing all kinds of sickness. I often tell people when they have some dreaded disease and uh, say when people say it's incurable and there's nothing more that can be done. And you hear that at times. But if only during those times we could only realize that there is no limit with God. We know that it's a point under man wants to die. We don't know when that is in each life. Does God have a specific time? It's, at least the Bible says he does. Can you enhance the time, rush the time by driving like a nut and getting killed earlier? Yes, <laughs> there's all kinds of things you can call premature death. But nonetheless, he, he, he has come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. But he says the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. That's what gets me. So I always encourage people, especially to get into the Gospels and read the, who Jesus was. Read what kind of a Christ he was. What did he do on earth? What did he do? Did he, did he just waste his time? No. He went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all that were sick. See, say that with me. Healing all that were sick. Now, I want to tell you that Jesus is the king of the kingdom. That's why we serve him. And unless a man is born again or accept Jesus as Lord of his life, he cannot even see heaven. Can't even see it. He'll never go in that direction. You must be born again. And we unashamedly do it at weddings, funerals, no matter where we're at. Anytime there's some crowd gathered together, we try to enlighten them to the fact that, yes, we care about the person that just passed. We're thinking about that right now. But how about you? What, what position are you in with the Lord? What would happen if your name was called and you left this life? Where would you go? Where, were you, where would a man spend eternity? On and on we could go about this truth. But Jesus is the king of the kingdom. That's why we promote him. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. I like, I like to do that with words. Sometimes people call it embellishment. I don't care what you call it. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. To God, who, is, who alone is wise, be honor, glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. I like to pray that way. I just like to brag on him. Say, Lord, you are El Elyon. Praise God. You're the, you're the strength of my life. Blessed be your name. You're king, immortal. Blessed be your name. You're Jehovah God. You're the creator. Amen. Yeah. Praise is precious. No, anyhow, I get into that sometimes. I forget where I'm at. I just love to do that. In uh, the sixth chapter of Timothy, verses 13 through 15, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate 
that you keep this commandment without spot and blamest until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. So how long shall we be doing this? Until he comes. Blessed be God. We're, most of us would like to be here when he comes. I'd just like to be there. I'd like to be the spectator at the dead in Christ rising first. I'd like to be near the cemetery, especially where a lot of believers are buried. I'd like to be there when the dead in Christ. So say, how are they going to do it? I don't know, but those big, you say, well, that place only use flat stones. I know, but sometimes they have the big other stones. But whether they're flat or whether they're perpendicular or whatever, those stones are going to lay aside, and the earth is going to split. And the dirt, the six-footed dirt is going to somehow diminish or fall away. And those caskets that are buried into a vault, the cement, I want to tell you, something's going to happen. That cement top of the vault's going to come out. That beautiful casket where the guy wound it down. Maybe an angel or somebody's going to unwind it, praise God. That lid's going to open up. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> and the dead, hallelujah. but I don't care how long they've been dead. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them. But we're going to see that because we're going to stand and watch the dead come out. They're going to be first. They're going to get their glorified body, and we're going to be joined with them. And in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to take on a glorified body that's incapable of death forever, live forever, without sickness, disease, or trouble or sorrow again. Hallelujah. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy about the king of Israel when he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Look at John 12 and 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Yeah, normal kings would be coming in on a white steed. But those kings that come in on a white steed, they're going to die like everybody else. But I know of Christ that he came into the city on a lowly colt. But one day when the heavens are split open, he's going to be riding a white steed. He's going to come out of the skies riding on a steed, and on him he's going to have a sword in his hand, and he's going to have a vesture that's been dipped in blood, and on that vesture is inscribed the words, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, can't you see it now in Jesus' name? Triumphant. Jesus was the king. Therefore, his ministry is a kingdom ministry. Then he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. I take that personal. He sent me, he sent you to represent him. You're a bona fide, anointed agent of God. You're an ambassador. You've got something to tell. And you're representing that kingdom that Jesus started on earth those 2,000 years ago. And it's blazing all over the world. Some of the greatest churches that are in, in the world are not in the United States. Some of the largest evangelical churches are in places like Brazil and Argentina, places that were almost totally other kinds of religion, but now people are born again and they come together by the thousands, some of the largest churches that ever, ever has been. So let's look at what he did in his ministry. For instance, in Nazareth, he read the prophecy of Isaiah about the Messiah King and claimed the ministry to his own, of his own. Let's look at it in, in Luke, the fourth chapter, and 17 through 19 first. He, why don't you read with me? It's more fun than just sitting there because you're getting sleepy. I can just tell it. Starts out like this. And then I used to have a guy in the church. He, I, he, I disliked the way he was because he'd always look straight at you while you preach. And his neck, you know, he, he, had, he was kind of a good guy, so he had a good-sized neck. But I'd watch him. He'd lock that neck in. <laughs> and you'd see a glaze coming over his eyes. <laughs> but he never lost his position. His eyes may blink, but they still do. <laughs> and he handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Are you reading with me? And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus talking here. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He touched in every vital area of life. All you need to do is trust him. You don't have to do tricks. You don't have to be a special character. You don't have to score 70 points in one game and embarrass the team. But, but anyhow, I've rest God, all you have to do is come as you are. You may never get an accolade in this life. Maybe you, you can't hit a golf ball 10 feet. You may not be able to shoot a three-pointer with a basketball. You may not be able to run a track. There's a lot of things you may not be able to do, but I can tell you one thing that you can do. You can get, come before the Lord and know that you're somebody, praise God, packed up and ready to go up. You're ready to go up because God's done something in you. He's placed in you something you could not earn, you could not buy, you could not find no matter if you search throughout the earth. He came and brought to you something that is eternal that's going to last you from here until eternity and then some. Can you say praise God? Hallelujah. The Messiah King. When John the Baptist sent messengers to inquire of Jesus, he sent back proof of his ministry. Notice the 11th chapter of Matthew, verses 4 and 5. They came to him and they said, John wants to know, you know, he wants to be sure who you are. And Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things that you hear and you see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear again, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached them. My Lord, John didn't need more than that. When he came back and told him these things, John was happy to know that that is the Christ, the Son of the living God. No man can do the works that he do, uh, that he has done, but bless God, he is special. You remember, you remember when Nicodemus got, he, Nicodemus kind of was a quasi-believer in Christ, but he was ashamed because he was kind of a, a lettered person. He was part of the Sanhedrin. And so he, he went to Jesus by night. But you notice what he said to Jesus? He said, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Praise God. And then, of course, Jesus began to preach about you must be born again. Instead of bragging about the miracles that he did, he could have to Nicodemus, because Nicodemus opened the door. He said, nobody could do this, Lord, unless God's with him. He said, yeah, God's with me. I can do anything I want, man. What you talking about? You know, oh, I forgot where I was for a minute. I thought I was at Highland Park. I was talking to some people there. But anyhow, isn't this fun? Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 4 and 5. Let's look at that again. Now what? Oh, that's it. That is not the scripture I want because we just did that, I think. Go to Matthew 12, 28. There you go. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Did you see the proof? See how this is tied to the kingdom of God? Now, if Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I send you. If the Bible says, You'll do the things that I do in John 14 and 12, and greater things than these shall you do because I go unto the Father. Then if you go on, it says, ye shall ask anything, ask anything of the Father in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is the work of the kingdom. Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. We're not being presumptuous and say, well, we have some power of the devil. We're not being presumptuous about that. We've been equipped to do it. We've been anointed. The mantle has been placed upon us to keep the kingdom of thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's just a quasi kingdom as far as the realm is concerned, but in the reign as far as the power is concerned, if you shall ask anything in my name. In other words, it's possible today, folks, to do exactly what Jesus did when he was on earth because he's in us He's anointed us. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower us. So the church, let's say it this way, is potentially capable of doing the same works that Jesus did 
Why we've gone to sleep on the job, I do not know. So we're doing the work of the king when we're casting out devils, when we're doing the work of God. And that's why it's so important. But I was saying there is a, there is a force, and the Bible tells us what it is. In Ephesians 6 and 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, principalities, powers that lurk in heavenly places all over, all around us. We cannot stand still any longer. The kingdom of God on earth, the reign of Christ, of which we are a part. We're not in that end-time realm when heaven comes down, so to speak, and we live in that new Jerusalem. But bless God, we're representing his reign, and we're working under his authority, and we can put a stop to this drive-by shootings and robberies and, and all kinds of things that are happening that put people in danger that can't even be in their own home be safe. It says we don't wrestle against flesh. But I thought we wrestled against those renegades and those guys that, well, yes, they act out the part, but there are evil spirits in heavenly places. I say in heavenly places. I just mean not the he farthermost heaven, but just in the upper heavens, about, approximately within, approximate where we are at. And they're influencing us. And that's why when demons are in control, they work against God's authority. And the ability to cast them out demonstrates the power and presence of the kingdom of God over demons. Luke chapter 11, verse 20 through 22. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, we don't have to wrestle with demons. I've seen everything in my life, I'm telling you. I've seen people cry and scream at demons. I've seen people try to talk to demons, get a conversation going back. I never had any interest in talking to them. I just speak to them, and I say, get out. And I mean now, not after a while. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Are you getting this today? When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Isn't that what the Bible says there? So we need to have the power of God. But if we have the power of God, we have the power to cast out devils. Amen. Well, how about casting out the devils that are surrounding our city? Yeah. How about the demons that are in, that come and inhabit our schools and create an atmosphere of not learning, but an atmosphere of fear where no, no, no telling what will happen. I have teachers, and I have teachers and principals. I've talked to them. I know what's going on in the public schools today. But I know one thing, if the church comes alive, we can slow this thing down to a halt. I don't know if you're happy about this or not. Say, I don't know. I just want to just live my life in peace in my neighborhood. Brother Dave, we don't have that in my neighborhood. I ain't worried about nothing. Our neighborhood's safe. Yeah, I know it's a gun-free gun area like Chicago's place where they shoot, shoot up about 60 people every, every weekend, and it's, a, it's called a gun-free zone. <laughs> yes, praise God. Help me, Jesus. I get to meddling with stuff, I tell you, and, and I just don't know. I get in such trouble just preaching. But I'm going to keep it up just the same. There are three areas in life of Jesus's, Jesus reveals to us his deep concern for the kingdom of God. One of his greatest sermons is the Sermon on the Mount. It was directed to the citizens of the kingdom of God. His parables were told to illustrate or picture the kingdom. His miracles were done to show the nature and character of the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount declared the laws of the kingdom. Just got to get into your Bible and read it. The parables of Jesus were earthly stories with spiritual meaning. The miracles of Jesus show his power over Satan and his works. Look at the 10th chapter of John, verses 37 38. I do not do the works, or if I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, Though you do not believe me, notice this is Jesus talking. Believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. How about having a works church? Maybe we ought to name it the first works church of Canton, Ohio, or something like that. Praise God. 
Amen. We don't just talk about it here. We do it. Amen. The authority and power that God has given to us equips us to manage the kingdom of God that's on earth. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 21 about this kingdom business. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed, read with me, the kingdom of God is within you. Praise God. We're the real deal. Amen. I said, we're the real deal. We're the legitimate yes. representative of the kingdom. And you know something? The devil is no match for the enlightened, equipped, spirit-filled believer. Right. Look at Matthew chapter 16, 18, and 19. Also, I say to you, you are Peter. I love this in the Amplified. It says, you are Peter. In the Greek, it's Petros. You're kind of a large piece of rock. But on this rock, and he said, he used a different Greek word, Petra, this huge rock like the rock of Gibraltar. I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, is what he tells me. Whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If any two on earth agree upon touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done. So devil, this, we're putting you on notice. We're not afraid of you, devil. I said, we're not afraid of you. We're not ignorant of your devices. We used to be afraid of you because we didn't know what, what you was going to sneak up. Now we got eyes behind our back. Hallelujah. Spiritual eyes. We know where you're at. We know what you do. We know your character. We'll put you on notice. You're not going to rule and reign around us any longer. We're sick and tired of you taking over our kids and our neighborhoods in the name of Jesus. We bind you. What if we did this as a church? You know, if any two on earth agree, and then two or three are gathered in my name, and you know about synergy, how this is as you keep adding people. What if the whole church got together and not just one person was saying, I bind you, devil? What if all of us together said, you foul spirit, you've intruded our city, our towns, our villages, our county. We're sick and tired of it. Maybe you want to get tough, you can say, in our state. If you want to get bolder, that our country. Just keep going with the thing and don't give up. Say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot rule or reign around us any longer. We're on private property, you foul intruding spirit. Oh, I wish we'd get tough with the devil. I wish we'd get tough with him. Look at Ephesians 1, 20, 23. We're going to end a little bit in just a moment, which is his body, the fullness of him who filleth all in all. The church is his body, which filleth all in all. What do we have to be afraid of? What if we could, instead of hanging down our head, Tom Dooley, put our shoulders back and say, hey, I'm somebody, not in your own personal ability, but in the strength of the cross. In the strength of Almighty God, if you could just stand up and say, I'm not just a mere person. I'm just a, not some rag part of a ragtag team. I'm not something the cat drug in. I, I used to be all kinds of care, whatever you wanted to call me then, but I've been born again. A new nature's coming. So I'm somebody now. And devil, whether you like it or not, you got to treat me like I'm a somebody. You could push me around before, but devil, I don't push so easy anymore. I've developed some spiritual muscles. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you fear, you foul spirit, I resist you and rebuke you in Jesus' name. And you must go because you must flee when the name of Jesus and the blood of Christ comes on the scene. Come on, give him a shout. Praise his precious holy name. Praise God. Verse, chapter 4, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. How about that? Well, now, wait a minute. we got to get some more in there. How about verse 32? And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one. Oh, that part too. I thought we didn't have to. I thought we could hold some grudges, Lord. We're going to be tough on the devil, but by the same token, I want to be tough on some of those people I don't like. Oh, Lord, I want to get them. I'm tough. No, I said be kind to one another. See, that's part of your strength. See, you know, if you really have the goods, you don't have to act tough. Do you ever notice people who are really tough don't act tough? People who are really rich don't act rich. 
You can always tell a phony baloney right away. Never mind that. Oh, Lord. More verses. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And that I have already attained. Start over again. Not that I've already attained or am ready, already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Remember that old song, life's clock is passing the hour. Time is going by fast, but we can do something about the time that's left in our possession. Let's take a stand. Say, you foul spirit, out. I vote you out. I command you out. Walk through the town, walk through city, walk through villages, walk through streets, unafraid. Say, you foul spirit, you control this street long enough. We know about the reputation you have around here, devil. Oh, there's shootings here every weekend. Yeah, there's, if you think Chicago's bad, how about a little town like Canton, Ohio? 17 right now unsolved murders right now in Canton. Just in the paper, right on the front page a few, few days ago, weeks, whatever it is. 17. Devil, what if we got, what if we did this? Devil, you've killed the last person in this town you're going to kill. Oh, I'm telling you. Let's stand on our feet. Let me just finish on your feet. I want to brag on Jesus a little bit like I like to do. We've been talking about the king in the kingdom. Bless God, we're a part of the kingdom. He's the king of the saints. He anoints my head with oil, restores my soul. He is the Lord, strong and mighty. He is the ransom for my soul. He is mighty in word and deed. He is the tender plant on dry ground. He's the only begotten of the Father. He's the apostle of our confession. He is the wise master builder. He is the quickening spirit. He's, he's God's unspeakable gift. He's the zeal of the Lord's host. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and he is that sure resting place for those who are weary. He is, he is the worker's companion. He is light to those who are in darkness. He reaches out to those who are downtrodden, and through sin, he abounds. Christ does much more abound. He is the answer and the solution to my dilemma. He's the Christ of Calvary, and I like to always sneak this part in. I can tell you this. You can't get him out of your mind, and you can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they could not stop him. The, the pilot couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their act together, and their testimonies didn't agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. We're talking about Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's give him a praise and a shout. Glory be to God forevermore. Brother Dave would be blessed to hear from you this week. Please call toll-free 877-453-2519 or locally 330-453-2519. Our address is tgtmail at trinitybrotherdave.org or Brother Dave, P.O. Box 20029, Canton, Ohio 44701. When you're in the Canton area, we invite you to visit Trinity Gospel Temple at 1612 West Tuscarawa Street, just off I-77. Or visit us online at www.trinitybrotherdave.org. It's been so good to be with you today. I always appreciate the opportunity of being with you. Uh, there's such a closeness that has developed and Sometimes I just wonder how it ever happened, but I, I feel such a uh, connection with you, spiritual connection. And it's just as if you're part of my family and I'm a part of you. I, I love you and I feel you love me back. And I appreciate that. God has given us this opportunity being together. And that's why I need you to support Brother Dave if you want me to continue in your area. I love your area and I want to pray and believe with you and preach to you. So keep me on the air by joining our partnership or in some way financially helping us and I'll be looking forward to hearing from you. But right now I want to pray for you. I know that some of you are ailing, some of you are sick, afflicted, 
and uh, you're really having trouble physically. I don't know if it's your heart or that's bothering. It's, you may have extreme pain in your body and your joints. So many things can happen to the frail human frame that we are. But I'm going to believe God with you. I really believe in miracles. In Mark 9:23, it says, if you can believe, all things are possible to the one who believes. So I'm going to believe with you. Let's partner together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, my heart reaches out to the people who are hurting so bad. They may be immobile, Lord, or it may be all different sorts of problems, ailments. But I ask you, Lord, to touch them today. I rebuke the devil. I come against sickness, disease, and I pray that restoration, healing, and deliverance will come to every man, woman, boy, and girl that I'm ministering to today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I plead the blood of Jesus over the people, and I praise you ahead of time for miracles, signs, and wonders that are happening right now. And I give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Write to Brother Dave this week. Let me know if you felt as you prayed with me something happened. I want to put, my, put myself in agreement with you. And I'll look forward to receiving your letter. Remember, I need you to pray for us and also for your kind financial support. I have to go. The Lord has blessed us real good. Amen.